we are in um, a relatively brief period of time going to talk about a whole bunch of important things, the future of democracy, the future of America, Russia, a couple other countries maybe as well. Um, but I want to start with you just on, on the events of the past week. Um, in his extraordinary presentation um, in the Senate, um, Brett Kavanaugh uh, said that the, quote, political hit job, end quote, uh, directed at him uh, was being done on behalf of the Clintons, among other people. Your response. <laughs> I mean, really, yes, it deserves a lot of laughter. Um, I wasn't watching when he said that. I was having to be somewhere else and away from a TV uh, and even my phone. And so I heard about it later. And, you know, look, I, I thought it was just part of the whole of his very defensive uh, and un, uh, you know, unconvincing presentation. Um, and I, I told someone later, boy, I'll tell you, they give us a lot of credit. Um, <laughs> 36 years ago, uh, we started this against, uh, against him. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. Back at Yale. Ba yeah, well, even before in high school, apparently. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I don't, you know, look, I, I want the FBI to conduct as uh, thorough an investigation as they possibly can within whatever restraints are imposed upon them. Um, but I think for anyone who believes there's such a thing as a judicial temperament and that we want judges, particularly those on our highest court, to approach issues, approach plaintiffs and defendants with um, a sense of fairness that there's a lot to be concerned about. Right. Um, I want to ask you a question about Dr. Ford for a minute. There are a lot of Democrats who, are, and a lot of other people, who are absolutely certain, 100%, her, her recollection is the absolute truth. I'm asking this as a lawyer. Do you feel 100% certain that the events that she described um, uh, are true and are therefore disqualifying? Look, I... I watched as much of her testimony as I could. I found her very credible. You have to ask yourself, why would anybody put themselves through this if they did not believe that they had important information uh, to convey to the Senate? She basically said that. She thought it was her civic duty. Uh, so I found, I found her presentation. I found her um, willingness to say, I don't remember that, but I remember this. Uh, to be uh, very convincing, and I, I, I felt a great swell of, you know, pride that she would be willing to put herself out there under these circumstances. Can, can you frame this a little bit in the context of what we're all seeing as our understanding to be almost a war developing between the genders or between large factions of gender? Um, Women's anger, of course, has become an enormous issue. Just fr frame that out against the backdrop of some of your own experiences in dealing with it being the, the, the first major party yeah. female candidate for president. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't frame it so starkly as you just did. I think what uh, is happening is that on many, many fronts, women and young women and girls are saying, you have to hear our stories too. We have the right to be heard. And I remember those, we saw it all on, on uh, TV, those two young women following Senator Flake uh, into the elevator. And they were determined that he would know that there were young women like them, representing many, many more, who wanted to be heard and wanted their stories to be taken seriously. So. I don't see it so much as some kind of conflict as finally righting the balance because there's been a tremendous imbalance on women's lives, women's narratives. They've been historically dismissed, condescended to. I have a chapter in my book um, about being a woman in politics and it's not just about me, it's about a lot of other women who find themselves picked apart uh, second-guessed, uh, held to a double standard, 
And at some point, it just is time to say, enough. You know, we want to be judged on our merits. We want to have as much right to our agency, to our autonomy, as we should be able to have. So it's, it's, it's trying to get back to, or maybe for the first time, get to a balance where women's lives are valued as much as men's lives, their stories are as important as men's stories, they are written into history, not out of history. So that's what I see happening. Right. And of course, there's some anger and frustration, but that's the core of it. There's, um, there's a lot of anger and frustration and rage among males. Um, and we saw that a little bit in, uh, I think, the performance, the testimony of, of Judge Kavanaugh. Forget the backdrop, the, the, the issues that brought that hearing to, 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 mm -hmm. to reality. Um, do you think that the temperament he showed in that hearing disqualifies him from the Supreme Court? And what would be, what would be the downstream consequence for the Supreme Court of someone who, in his confirmation hearing, um, was as um, obviously partisan? Yeah, no, I think talk, these, talk about that. A well, little these bit. are these are hard questions, Jeffrey. And you know, I was in the Senate for eight years. I voted against um, uh, nominees from President George W. Bush on the basis of um, you know their positions. But I don't remember any of them, nor the most recent appointment by President Trump of uh, Justice Gorsuch behaving in such a way. I mean, I disagree with them about issues. I regret that they um, take the stands that they take. I worry about the consequences of their decisions, how it will affect you know, so many people and their lives and our country as a whole. But this latest example is in a different category. We, we have not seen anything quite like that uh, for a long time. Uh, you know, Justice Thomas vigorously defended himself, as some of us can remember, uh, and it was a, a very painful, difficult time for Anita Hill and for many of us watching, and I, I remember the march of women in the House over to the Senate, because again, it, it very much felt like, in fact it probably was, uh, the denial of the legitimacy of women's stories. In this case, though, the performance, the behavior, uh, was, was quite out of bounds. I, I don't ever remember anything like that. And you know, as somebody who has testified uh, under <laughs> difficult circumstances, um, I, uh, I, I, I would wonder about... You were never so emotional. Well, look, for 11 hours you couldn't have been, but for... <laughs> for whatever period of time. So there is such a thing that you seek in judges of a judicious temperament. You know, people who are able to discipline themselves, to be open to the evidence wherever it might lead, uh, to be fair to all the litigants who are appearing uh, before them. You know, I'm a recovering lawyer. I used to practice uh, law, and I was in different kinds of courts. Uh, and this was quite unusual what right. we saw the other day, right. and certainly uh, the senators should, on both sides of the aisle, take that into account. It's not like there's not a long list of other judges who would decide the same way. You know, Democrats didn't necessarily all want to support Justice Gorsuch, but nobody was standing up saying that, uh, not only do I disagree with him, but I don't think he's uh, temperamentally fit for the bench. So there's a long list of people that could be chosen from in order to uh, get to the same result in terms of the issues uh, that are important to this president and the Republicans in Congress. Right. So just before we close this out, no vast left-wing conspiracy <laughs> organized by you against Brett Kavanaugh. It would have had to have happened starting 36 years ago, and that seems a stretch even for the vast right-wing conspiracy stories about me. Can I, can I ask you a question about that language? Um, I understand the, the situation which, which gave rise to the, to the expression vast right-wing conspiracy, mm -hmm. but given where political discourse has gone, do you regret uh, using that kind of language? Do you think that, that over the past 15, 20 years we all have not been as careful 
as we should have been about the way we describe political opposition, political opponents? Well, look, when I, when I said that, I was aware of a very well-organized effort that had been going on for some years. It didn't start in the 90s. It predates the 90s uh, of powerful interests on both economic and ideological grounds trying to undo a lot of the progress that we'd made as a country. Uh, they were against, uh, some of them against the New Deal, you know, maybe some against you know, the progressive era back in the turn of the last century, but they were certainly against uh, the um, uh, Great Society, against a lot of what President uh, Johnson was able to accomplish in terms of supporting uh, people uh, providing you know, Medicaid, providing Medicare. Th th there is a very significant and influential uh, and well-funded and quite uh, uh, persistent um, effort in the country that has been going on for quite some time. Uh, now, I think it is important to kind of keep doors open, but it's difficult to keep doors open when there seems to be uh, this concerted effort to slam doors in the faces of people with whom uh, the other side disagrees or on uh, grounds of economics or health care, you know, want to make life more difficult. So I, I am certainly in the camp that says, look, we should start trying to talk to each other, listening to each other, but how do you talk to former colleagues of mine in the Senate who are Republicans who denied Judge Merrick Garland even the courtesy of meetings, let alone a hearing and a vote. The Constitution gives the responsibility to the president to nominate and to the Senate for advice and consent. So when you are dealing with um, a political uh, entity like the modern Republican Party that is trying to win at all costs, it's hard to know quite how to get in there to have that conversation. Uh, and I think the best thing we can do is to take back the House and the Senate in November and then start having a conversation. Right. The, um, so in, um, in the essay of yours that we just published in The Atlantic, uh, which is uh, based on the, the new epilogue to this book, mm -hmm. um, which is just out this week, I believe, um, uh, you, you describe um, the unspeakable cruelty of the Trump administration, the monstrous neglect uh, of the Trump administration related to Puerto Rico. You write that Trump and his cronies do so many despicable things that you can't keep them straight. This is all in the first paragraph um, <laughs> of the essay. When I read it a, a couple right. of months ago, I thought, now she's gone to 11. Um, the, 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 walk us through a little bit your analysis of where we are. We're practically at, the, at, a, at a midpoint in this presidency. Uh, even I was surprised at the, 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 the level of your, uh, uh, your judgment on, on what's happened so far. Talk about this in the, con in the specific context of, of the threat to democracy that you see emanating from the White House. Well, I... Um I would have wanted it to be different. Uh, I said in my concession speech, we needed to give the president an open mind and uh, try to come together as a country. And from the beginning, starting with the speech he gave at the inauguration, it was clear that that was not his intention. He was not going to be reaching out to the country, to people who had voted against him, who had doubts about him. He wanted to just to double down on the people who uh, supported him. That's one thing, that's a political calculation. But then the, um, the policies of the administration. Now, there did seem to be two major substantive reasons why people, uh, Republicans, would have supported him despite the doubts of other Republicans. One, cut taxes, cut it to the bone, disable the government as much as possible, throw us into exploding deficits and unbelievable debt, then go after Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, which they've never liked anyway, and they're on their path to doing that. And they seem almost uh, gleeful about it. You know, their, their budget process up on the Hill right now is all about how do we take money out of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid using the excuse that, well, we're going to have these big deficits and debts. And 
Of course, they are the ones who have really hit the, uh, the ignition on having such uh, a fiscally irresponsible policy. They also wanted to get the Supreme Court uh, majority so they could continue to side with corporations. Uh, they could continue to uh, move toward uh, restricting, if not overturning, Roe v. Wade. They could continue to protect big politi political interests like they did with um, Citizens United in terms of undisclosed uh, money. And they could continue to shrink the electorate, which they did with the Voting Rights uh, Act, which you know, has spawned this explosion of uh, suppression. Uh, He's effective as president, isn't he? Well, he has Republicans in the Congress who go along with him, who well, are- I'm who, looking at trade this week, I'm looking at- Well, his... look, I, look, it's not like everything he does all day is uh, bad. Um, there are things that occasionally, much to my surprise, do pop up and say, okay. I mean, basically he took the much reviled Trans-Pacific Partnership Act and he took elements out of it that the Obama administration had negotiated and stuck them in to what is the latest iteration, NAFTA 2.0. But here's what I've been more concerned about. Put aside even the uh, judicial threats to individual rights to our, our uh, you know, future as a, as a nation together and put aside the economic damage that is gonna be done uh, in the medium term. I say in my afterword, there are these concerted assaults on our democracy, degrading the rule of law. We have seen it every, every week of this administration. Uh, the kind of insulting comments made about the FBI, about our intelligence agencies, about uh, the whole law enforcement uh, process of our country, um, and trying to go after individuals and, and make them uh, the the signals to others in the Justice Department and elsewhere uh, that we're preferring to be a rule of men, prefer preferably one man, as opposed to the rule of law. So degrading the rule of law. Delegitimizing our elections. I mean, the ongoing threat from the Russians, from the uh, uh, kind of tactics we saw in 2016 has not abated. Uh, it is still there. They were successful. They're not going away. That really is and should be a concern to everybody, regardless of party. Uh, number three, the attacks on truth and reason and facts, which started, as we remember, right after the uh, inauguration was done on the uh, steps of the Capitol. I've been to every inauguration since 1993. There weren't that many people there, let's be honest. And all of a sudden, <laughs> You know, you have the president. Now you're just trolling him. Yeah, the now you're just. The, the president's, you're really. Uh, you know, the president's new staff, they're settling into the White House and they're being trotted out in front of the camera with phony pictures and claims. And you, you had to say to yourself, wait a minute, this kind of stuff happens not in the United States. This happens somewhere else. It happens in authoritarian regimes where they try to literally change reality in front of you. The fourth, spreading corruption. You know, look, there, there are so many examples of this and it deeply concerns me. I write about some of them in the afterword. Um, but to see decisions being made, as I believe they have been, on what's best for uh, him personally, his family, his business, his cronies, uh, is you know, more than uh, I would have expected. And then finally, undermining our national unity pitting us versus them. And that goes back to your question about why can't we you know, try to once again engage in some kind of dialogue and debate. Well, there are some people who are worthy of that and a whole lot of other people who aren't. And all of that goes right at the core of what it means to have a democracy. Do you think he's a racist? I think he has thrown his lot in with many people and groups whose stated objective is white nationalism, white supremacy. I mean, how could you explain uh, what he did and why after Charlottesville? I mean, we need a president at moments like that, regardless of party, and we saw it. Think, remember what George W. Bush did after 9-11. You know, he went to a mosque. He went to a uh, gathering place for American Muslims in order to say, we're not at war with you. We're at war with those people who plotted and planned to drive those airplanes into the World Trade Center. 
But that's not what we got after Charlottesville, and that remains one of the most troubling episodes uh, in this uh, presidency. So what's the word for someone who uh, consorts with racists, it takes advantage of racist to elevate him. No, 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 I mean, it's a serious yeah, question. Yeah, it is a serious like, what's question. The, what, what's the, how do you define this? Like, when, when do you just become a racist yourself if you're taking advantage of racism to advance your own personal goals? Well, but, it, but it's, what he's doing is broader even than that because he has been uh, uh, racist, he's been sexist, he's been Islamophobic, he has been uh, anti uh, LGBTQ. I mean, there's a long list. It, it, I don't think it's useful to say, oh, we figured it out, this is what he is. He has a view of America that is incredibly constricted. And he talks to that America. He talks to them all the time. And it's by no means a majority, as we know, um, but it is a very hardcore who are responding to him and supporting him for a variety of reasons, um, whatever they might be, economic reasons, uh, Supreme Court reasons, or some of these other uh, more troubling biases and prejudices. Uh, you are, are fairly rare in Washington these days in that you have direct experience with two of the most controversial presidents in American history, Donald Trump and Richard Nixon. Hmm. Um, talk about the two of them. Talk uh, about, uh, <clears throat> it's, maybe it's too early in Trump's term um, to render a judgment, but um, Richard Nixon, Donald Trump, who's the worst president? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will leave that to history. What Jeffrey's referring to is that when I was a very young lawyer, I was on the House, House Judiciary Impeachment Inquiry uh, staff. Uh, gathering evidence at the request direction of the House Judiciary Committee uh, to determine uh, whether Richard Nixon should be impeached. You cannot make my life up, I will just tell you that. Um, <laughs> so I was, very, I was very young, I was working with superb lawyers, and I will tell you what was most significant to me is that there was no prejudging. Uh, we were told the way we had to proceed was to collect facts, and the facts would then lead to other facts which would lead to uh, conclusions. But we were not to jump to conclusions, and in those days, this was obviously pre-computer, the way we collected our facts was on index cards, and we had thousands and thousands of index cards. But I so respected the, both the Democratic and Republican uh, lead lawyers uh, in the way that they conducted themselves. You know, Richard Nixon uh, is in many ways uh, a tragic figure, I think. I think that, you know, there were many things he did that, uh, again, were uh, quite laudatory. Uh, from my perspective, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Legal Services Corporation, he, he started a lot of institutions uh, within uh, Washington. He was willing to look at problems and try to, you know, fix them, but he became fixated on his position, his power, his enemies, his adversaries, and that's when he went awry. He went uh, after them. He went after them through burglaries. I mean, you think about it, you know, the Watergate burglars stole paper. Uh, the Russian burglars stole online uh, cyber material. Same purpose, to win elections, uh, to put down your opponent. So there, there are some similarities, but I think that it would be difficult uh, at this time, certainly, to you know, draw those parallels. I think, again, what you want, what I would want, is no prejudgment. You go with the facts wherever the facts lead you. If you've read Mueller's two indictments, which if you're interested, I, I recommend because they tell quite a story they are so precise and they are so detailed. One about the social media uh, interference, uh, weaponization of information by the Russians and their proxies, their bots and their trolls and everybody else, uh, even real Russian agents who were embedded in uh, our country who were running false news sites and the like. And the second indictment is 
chapter and verse about the hacking. Not only the hacking of the DNC and the hacking of John Podesta, but the hacking of um, the DNC cloud and the theft of information that we were using to target undecided or persuadable voters. So it's worth looking at that because not to go backwards, but to go forwards, and frankly to go forwards to November 6th, we don't know what's happening right now. I wish we did. I wish we had a government that actually cared about uh, the level of attack that is happening. But more and more reporters, more and more political scientists are really digging deep and uncovering a lot along with uh, the Mueller investigation. Do you, you, do you think that the Trump administration and the uh, eight various agencies are doing enough to stop what you're describing no. as a continued... No. But I mean, look at the Congress just a few weeks ago refused to pass a bipartisan piece of legislation to provide more support to states to protect themselves against uh, further intrusions and thefts of information, maybe interferences with the machines. We now know that the machines are eminently hackable. Uh, and very few states have taken the necessary steps to protect themselves against that. And so the Congress turned a blind eye. They turned away this bipartisan legislation. And of course, the administration thinks this redounds to their benefit. So they're not particularly interested right now. But things change. I mean, you know, Putin could wake up with a headache and decide he doesn't like the Republicans anymore. Who knows? Uh, but this is the kind of general threat this attack on our nation that should be taken seriously by everybody and should be uh, the number one issue on um, our national security uh, headline right now. Two years later, virtually two years later, do you believe the formula is as simple as this, Vladimir Putin stole the election from you? I, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for the evidence that is being presented. But and do you believe that the election I, I believe was stolen that, from I you? I believe that the combination of the Russian uh, campaign, the WikiLeaks uh, being the cutout for uh, Russian uh, stolen information, uh, the role that Cambridge Analytica and other organizations like that played in connection with the Republican apparatus, the National Committee, and other uh, allies, and the Trump campaign certainly altered the outcome in enough places that we have to ask what really happened. But again, I don't want to look backwards, and I try to say that in the afterword. I try to say two things. Yes, if we ever get to the bottom of this, we will learn even more than we know now, and what we know now is incredibly troubling. There's a new book coming out, uh, I think in the end of the week, by uh, the political science professor Kathleen Hall Jameson, and in it, she goes, boy, deep as you can get into the two different forms of the attack, basically following the Mueller indictments, the social media attacks and the hacking attacks. And she concludes that the hacking attacks had a demonstrable impact on the outcome. That's not me, that's her. And obviously, I didn't even know she was writing it. Uh, so we do have to get to the bottom of this. I mean, it is the first time, as I say in the afterword, that we have been attacked by a foreign power and have done nothing. I mean, it would be like, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's a horrible example, but after 9-11, George W. Bush said, well, you know, I, I don't have time to meet. I don't have time to about this. It was terrible. We feel sorry about it. We'll rebuild New York and the Pentagon, but we're not going to worry about it. Well, at a certain point, that's what this is turning into. The evidence continues to accumulate. Uh, people in Congress have tried on a bipartisan basis to deal with it, to get more help out there to uh, states and counties, because we have such a decentralized election system. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not doing enough. And I can only hope and pray that we don't see a repeat uh, of what happened in the midterm elections. I have one final short question for you, and asking on behalf of a lot of people who asked me this. Um, your paperback is out. Um, What's next for you? I am do, I'm having the best time. I'm doing a lot of really interesting and new things for me. So for example, and there's a lot of stuff, but I'll just give you one. I read a book um, that a friend of mine, uh, my good friend, Lisa Muscatine, who uh, along with her husband, Brad, owns Politics and Prose, the great bookstore here. She sent me a book called The Woman's Hour. 
um, by a historian I did not know, a woman named Elaine Weiss. And I read it, and it's about the absolutely concluding fight for the 19th Amendment to give women suffrage in our country, which will be 100 years in 2020. I read it, I was so captivated, I called the author and I said, I love your book and the characters just come alive and it's so hard fought to the very end, it only passed by one vote. I said, have you thought about maybe trying to get a movie made or a series made? She said, well, I wouldn't even know where to start. And I said, well, could I help you? And she said, sure. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I called a few people, including my longtime friend, Steven Spielberg, and I said, Steven, <laughs> there now is Now this, you're just name dropping. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm totally name dropping. I said, there is this fabulous book about the fight to pass suffrage in the last state, Tennessee. It takes place in Nashville in July and August um, of you know, 2020, uh, 1920. And I said, I think it would be a great movie series. And so he said, well, I'll, you know, we'll read it. We'll look at it. They loved it. So we're going to be working on that. And I'm going to be working on that. I'm very excited about it. Secretary Clinton, thank you very much for joining thank us you. today. Thank, thank you, you all. Everyone.